in the last program, I spoke to you on the topic of peace. I want to deal today with something that is very intimately linked with peace, and that is joy. One of the most frequently quoted sentences in Christian literature is that famous sentence of St. Augustine, where he says, Our hearts were created for you, O Lord, and they are restless until they find their rest in you. Every time I hear that sentence of St. Augustine, I am reminded of another sentence made famous by one of our great religious mystical poets in India, a man called Kabir. He writes a lovely poem that begins with the following sentence. He says, I laughed when they told me that the fish in the water is thirsty. Take a little while to get that image. The fish in the water, thirsty. How could that be? We human beings, surrounded by God and restless. Take a look at creation all around you, everywhere. Trees, birds, grass, animals. You know something? The whole of creation is shot through with joy. The whole of creation is happy. Oh, I know there is suffering, there is pain, there is growth and decline and aging and death. You find that in the whole of creation, but no restlessness, no unhappiness, if you really understand what happiness means. Only the human fish is thirsty. Only the human heart is restless. Isn't that strange? What I want to explore with you in this program is why are human beings unhappy? And what can we do to change that happiness into joy? Why are people unhappy? For two reasons mainly. Because they have wrong ideas and they have wrong attitudes. Let's begin with the ideas. The first wrong idea that people have is that joy means being on a high, having pleasurable sensations, having fun. It's because they have this idea that people go in for intoxicants and stimulants, and then they end up depressed. The thing to be intoxicated on is life. It's a quieter kind of intoxication, but it is lasting. So that's the first wrong notion we must get rid of, that joy means having a high. No, no, not necessarily. The second wrong notion, to think that we can chase after happiness, we can do something to get happiness. Well, I'm almost contradicting myself here because soon I'm going to tell you what we can do to attain happiness. But happiness cannot be sought in itself. Happiness is the offshoot of something else. You know, true happiness is barely an experience so that when it is deepest, you're hardly aware of it. And that is the reason why it has been said and so wisely and so well that happiness is really a memory. It is barely an experience. There's the second wrong notion we have to get rid of then. And the third and probably the most important wrong notion about happiness is that happiness is found in externals. You know, Happiness is found in other things, in other people. I change my job, maybe I'll be happy. I'll change the place I'm living in, maybe I'll be happy. I'll marry somebody else, maybe I'll be happy. Happiness has nothing to do with externals. 
And so people think money, power, respectability, these bring happiness. They don't. Poor people can be happy. I remember reading the story of a Nazi prisoner. The poor man was tortured every day. And then one day, they changed his prison cell. You know, he had four bare walls. And in his new prison cell, he has a skylight through which he can see a patch of blue during the day and some stars at night. And the man is ecstatic. He writes home thrilled about this great good fortune. When I read that story, I looked out of my window and I had the whole expanse of nature to gaze at. I was free. I was not a prisoner. I could go wherever I wanted. And I didn't have a fraction of the joy of that poor prisoner. I remember reading a novel of a, a man, a prisoner in a Soviet concentration camp in Siberia. The poor man is awakened at 4 o'clock in the morning. They give him a chunk of bread. And the man thinks, I'd better keep some of this bread because I may need it at night. I cannot go to sleep because I'm hungry. And maybe if I eat it at night, I'll sleep. And then at the end of the day, after working all day, he crawls into bed. He covers himself with a blanket that barely keeps him warm. And he's thinking. He's saying, it's been a good day today. Today, I didn't have to work where the icy wind blows. And tonight, if I wake up hungry, I've got a piece of bread with me. So I'll eat it and I'll sleep well. Joy. Happiness. Would you believe it? I met an extraordinary woman once. She was paralyzed from the neck down. Where did she find that joy that she seemed to perpetually have? Everybody would be asking that. One day she said to me, I have all the loveliest things in life. I can do all the loveliest things in life. Paralyzed, in hospital, full of joy. So joy is not found in externals. Get rid of that notion, or else you'll never find it. There's another thing we have to get rid of if we want to find happiness and joy, and that is change some of our wrong attitudes. What are those attitudes that need to be changed? The first attitude, I would say, is the attitude of the sulking child. You've ever seen a child who says, unless you play the game my way, I'm going home? That attitude. Examine yourself as I'm talking right now. Think of something that's making you unhappy. And see if you can detect this sentence that you're saying almost unconsciously to yourself. You're saying, unless I get this or that or the other, I refuse to be happy. Unless this or that or the other is given to me or happens, I refuse to be happy. Lots of people are not happy because they're putting conditions to their happiness. So find out if that exists in your heart and drop it. There's a nice story of a man who was always pestering God with uh, all sorts of requests. So God appeared to him one day and said, look, I've had enough. Three requests, no more. Three petitions. And after I've given you that, I'm going to give you nothing else. So make your wishes. And the man was delighted. He said, you mean you will give me any three things I asked for? And God said, yes, but nothing more. So the man said, you know, uh, I feel a little ashamed to say this. But uh, I'd like to get rid of my wife because uh, she's a nag and uh, she's always, you know, it's unbearable. I, I cannot live with her. So if I could uh, get rid of her, so God said, all right, your wish will be granted. And his wife died. Well, the man felt guilty about the relief he felt in his heart, but he felt happy. He felt relieved. He thought, I'll marry someone else who's more attractive. 
when the relatives and his friends came to the funeral, they began to praise this woman who had died. And the man suddenly came to his senses. He said, my God, here was this lovely woman and I hadn't even noticed her. I didn't appreciate her when she was living. So he felt awful about that. He went running back to God and he said, bring her back to life. So God said, all right, second wish granted. Now he had only one wish left. So he thought, what shall I ask for? And he consulted. And some of his friends said, ask for money. If you have money, you can get anything. And other friends said, what's the use of money if you have no health? And others said, what's the use of health if you have to die someday? Ask for immortality. So the poor man didn't know what to ask for. Because others would say, what's the use of living forever if you have no one to love you? Ask for love. So he thought, and he thought. And one year went by, and five years, and ten years, and he hadn't asked for anything yet. So one day God appeared to him and said, when are you going to ask for that third wish of yours? And the poor man said, Lord, I'm all confused. I don't know what to ask for. Uh, could you tell me what to ask for? Could you advise me? And the Lord laughed when he heard that. He said, all right, I'll tell you what to ask for. Ask to be happy no matter what you get. There is the secret. So that's the first attitude to get rid of, the sulking child. The second attitude, the clinging child. You know, if you cling to your negative emotions, you're never going to be happy. Now, I don't mean you shouldn't have what we call negative emotions. You wouldn't be human. You would not be human if you didn't occasionally feel depressed and if you didn't sometimes feel anxious and if you didn't grieve at some loss, you wouldn't be human. That's all right. You can feel those negative emotions and let them go. You know what the bad thing here is when you cling to them? Try this exercise out. It's going to be a little difficult, but very rewarding. Your heartbreak, your jealousy, your guilt, your resentment. Ask yourself, what would happen if I let them go? You know, in the East, we have a thing called a koan. It's one of those deep spiritual exercises. It's a question, really, that the master puts to the disciple, a question that has no rational answer. For instance, what is the sound of one hand clapping? What was the shape of your face before you were born? That sort of thing. I'm going to give you a koan as an exercise. Ask yourself, what would happen if I dropped this negative emotion that I have, my guilt, my heartbreak, my jealousy, my resentment, etc. If you stay with that question, if you stay with that koan, you know what's likely to happen? A fear will come up within you. And then continue to ask the question, what will happen? You may make a great discovery. I'm not going to say any more about this exercise. I'm going to go straight on to the next part of this program, namely, how can we attain happiness and joy? And I'm going to propose four simple exercises here, simple means of getting joy. The first one, I'm not going to tell you. You guess it from the story that I'm going to tell you is the great Japanese Zen master, Ryokan. Now, Ryokan lived at the foot of a hill and lived a very simple life. One day when he was away, a thief came to his house to steal. And he found nothing there. And while the thief was in the house, the master returned and he caught him red-handed. And the master said, 
you have traveled a great distance to come to meet me. You must not go away empty-handed. And so he gave him his blanket and his clothes. He pressed them on the thief and said, here, take this. So the poor bewildered thief took this and slunk away. And after he had gone, the master sat at the door of his hut and looked at the gorgeous moonlight. And he thought, poor fellow, I wish I could have given him this gorgeous moon. What kind of an exercise is this story recommending? I keep you guessing for a while, and I'll tell you later. You know, this exercise and the previous one, the koan, are excellent for long-term results. You want short-term results. You want to experience joy immediately. You want to experience happiness at once. Try the following three other exercises that I am going to propose. The first, try saying how lucky I am, how grateful I am. Because you know something? It is impossible to be grateful and unhappy. There's the story of a man who comes running to his rabbi one day. And he says, Rabbi, you've got to help me. My house is a hell. We're living in one room, me and my wife and my children and my in-laws, and it's a hell. There's no place there. The rabbi smiled and said, all right, I'll help you. But you've got to make a promise to do anything that I tell you. And the man said, I promise, I really promise. It's a solemn promise. And the rabbi said, how many animals do you have? And the man said, well, we've got a cow, we've got a goat, and we've got six chickens. The rabbi said, take the animals into the room and come back after a week. A man was stunned, but he had promised, see. So he went home depressed, and he took the animals in. And the following week, he comes back in tears. He says, Rabbi, I'm going crazy. We're all going crazy. We're on the verge of a nervous breakdown. You've got to do something. What can we do? And the rabbi said, go home and put the animals out. And come back after a week. The man ran all the way home. And when he came back the following week, his eyes were aglow. He says, Rabbi, the house. It's wonderful, so clean, it's a paradise. Get the point? I read a lovely sentence once of someone who said, I had no shoes, and I was always complaining that I had no shoes, until I met someone who had no feet. Think of that extraordinary woman, Helen Keller, dumb, blind, deaf, and yet rejoicing in life. If you can find it in your heart to be grateful, you will find the secret of happiness. Try this. Here's the third exercise I'm proposing, I would propose to you. Sometime later, put yourself in the place of that paralyzed woman that I talked to you about before, remember? Put yourself in her place. You could even lie flat on the floor, the better to get into that mood. Imagine that you're paralyzed and say the following sentence, that lovely sentence that I heard from her lips. I can do all the loveliest things in the world. I have the loveliest things in the world. Find out what those loveliest things are. You'll discover love. You will discover taste and smell and sight and hearing, that you can hear the song of birds and the wind in the trees and the voices of your friends, and you can see their faces. You will find them all. Maybe in doing this exercise, you will stumble upon the secret of gratitude. And here's one more exercise that you may want to try, a very simple one. 
think of yesterday, go over all the events that took place yesterday, one after the other, and at each event, be grateful. Say thanks. Remember in the previous program, when I talked to you about peace, I told you, say yes. So here, say thanks. How lucky I was. How lucky I was that that happened to me. Oh, and you will probably come to some things that were unpleasant and that you didn't like. Then stop. Is there a sulking child there? Is there a clinging child there? There isn't? All right, then think. That thing that happened to me, it has seeds for growth. It was placed there for my good. Think of that and say thanks and go on. There's one last exercise that I would like to propose, and this has to do with faith. The previous two had to do with gratitude. Remember how lucky I am, how grateful I am. This has to do with faith. The faith that everything is given by God and allowed by God for my good. There's an extraordinary English woman, Juliana of Norwich, and she writes in one of her books, The Showings of Divine Love, what I consider to be the loveliest sentence I have ever read in my whole life. She says, and all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of thing shall be well. She says this in the context of a vision that she had, where she sees God holding the whole of the universe in his arms, lovingly, tenderly. Now here is the final exercise I suggest. I call it the blessing. Think of the events of the past, pleasant ones, unpleasant ones, and at each event say, it was well, it was well. And think of some of the things that you have now and that are happening to you now and say, it is well, it is well, and think of some of those things of the future and say, it will be well, it will be well, and see what happens to you. See how your faith will be changed into joy. Your faith that everything is in the hands of God and everything, as St. Paul tells us, will work for our good. Let me summarize then everything I've told you in this program, I told you why we are not happy, we have wrong notions, particularly that wrong notion that joy and happiness is in externals. There's an interesting story of this man who comes running to a monk that happens to be passing by his village. And he comes to the monk and says, give it to me, give me the stone, give me the precious stone. And the monk says, what stone are you talking about? And the man says, last night God appeared to me in a dream. And he said, a monk will be passing by the village tomorrow at noon. If he gives you a stone that he has in his sack, you will be the richest man in the country. So give me the stone. And the monk rummaged in his sack, and he pulled out a diamond, the largest diamond in the world. It was the size of a man's head. And he says, is this the stone you want? I found it in the forest. If you want it, take it. So the man grabbed the stone and went running all the way home. But he couldn't sleep that night. And early next morning, he came to where the monk was sleeping under a tree and he woke him up and he said, here, take this diamond back. Give me the inner riches that makes it possible for you to give this stone away. 
that is what we have to discover if we want to find joy. And I've given you five exercises as a help to attain that. The koan, remember, ask yourself that question. Why, what would happen to me if I gave up my negative feelings? The second exercise, I didn't make it explicit, but it is the same exercise that I suggested in the first and the second program. Looking, hearing, getting in touch with your body sensations, and you will be overtaken by silence and peace and joy. And then I gave you three exercises for short-term results. The identification, I call it. Namely, identify with that paralyzed woman. The exclamation, how lucky I am, how grateful I am, and the blessing. It was well, it is well, it will be well. In the next program, I will be talking to you about life. But when this program gets over, within a minute or two, I would suggest that you stay there. If you're listening to this program in a group, some of you may want to lie on the floor and identify with that paralyzed women, woman. Some of you may want to sit right where you are and close your eyes and do one of the other exercises that I recommended. There's just one objection that some of you may have before you get into this exercise. You may think, is this prayer? Because, you know, we're not talking to God. Think what a lovely prayer it is, how it would gladden the heart of God when he sees his children optimistic, grateful, happy. There is no sweeter prayer on earth than a grateful heart. If you ever get that, then the whole of your life will become a prayer, and the whole of creation will become a temple and a church.